Welcome to LT TV Weekly, episode nine. We've done the checks. We've gone back and counted to nine. We're there. Um, seems a long time ago that we started this show. And uh, as we said last week, been a fantastic response from supporters. Of course, tonight we were scheduled to have the club doctor, Harjinder Singh, on with us. Uh, given that he's the most important man at the club at the moment in the current pandemic circumstances, he's had to rush away. Uh, not for an emergency to do with Leicester Tigers, so there's no need to worry and there's no need for people to write stories about it. Um, he's had to step away for a meeting, but he's promised us that we'll catch up with him next week to go through the questions. We had some great questions in from supporters for him. So in his place off the bench, uh, you could call him COVID's own Sam Harrison because he's coming in off the bench tonight. We've brought in our official COVID officer, Stuart Barnes, who is the facilities manager, if I'm correct, at Leicester Tigers. Is that right, Stuart? I believe we should say head of stadium operations. Right. And COVID manager. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Unfortunately. Legally, we've, we've got your title right, so we're okay. We'll make sure yeah. HR isn't blowing up at that. So Stuart is going to answer some questions about especially the important things that have been put in place and the people working around the clock this week to see the players come in on Monday, of which, of course, my co-host, Jordan Murphy, while not directly involved on Monday, Jordy, you will be certainly overseeing things from a point of view of making sure the boys turn up. Yeah, very exciting. Um, the guys are going to be back at Oval Park. Um, obviously, we've spent a lot of time planning that, and that stage one, we're very conscious that it has a real s and focus. Um, so the guys will be in running socially distanced in, in small groups. Um, I will be on site um, just to make sure that everyone's there and try and have conversations when and where possible. But um, yeah, we're conscious that uh, at stage one, we're, we're just going to let the guys get a little bit of a base under, underneath their, uh, their belts and, and, they, and they've got some tough work ahead of them. Have those conversations from a distance as well, won't you? You'll be yelling across the three, two metre rule. Yeah, I don't really have to yell. I'm, I'm pretty good at communicating um, from distances of over two meters but it's it's not that far so um yeah no it's it's a um, it's really exciting it's uh, it's taken a lot of hard work and, and planning um Stuart's done a, a great job in, in getting over park up and it, we you know i suppose he, I'll, I'll leave it to him to to tell you some of the things that we have done at over park to ensure that the guys are safe um but i um yeah it's just been a lot of planning in, in around it and, and you know both himself harsh and simon wallace have done a great jobs before we get into that and we do touch on the interesting topic around returning to training and all the protocols that have been put in place before we bring I guess Stuart or, or Stuart Sam Harrison off the bench Geordie I have to ask you and I I want to ask you for those out there it has not been a slow news week in the world of rugby specifically premiership rugby so I'm going to tick off a couple of questions here if you don't mind um, first things first in the last seven days obviously in March you confirm the list of departing players. In the past seven days, we've seen Will Spencer confirmed as going to Bath Rugby and Guy Thompson going to Eel, Ealing, Trail, Ealing Trail Finders. So I've got that one out there eventually. Both players, I looked at the records, both played 33 games in exactly the same amount of time at the club. Two guys that have both admitted as well probably didn't have the impact or didn't have the time at Tigers they would have wanted. Yeah, well, COVID obviously introduced some really tough challenges for us this season, uh, and it sort of stopped the season in in early March. So, um, you know, the, the, the standard procedure for us when players leave is, you know, we, we exit them with with great respect, and and COVID hasn't afforded us that um, ability. You know, we want to bring the guys in, we want to present them shirts, we want to thank them for their time. So, it was really difficult transitioning the guys out this year, and, and you know every year we, we make changes, and, and unfortunately that's just the way the game is now. You know you have arrivals, you have departing players every year. Um, both guys um, made some great sacrifices for the club, and, and you know we're really proud that they played for us, and, and they'll always be very very welcome at Welford Road. Um, it was a real shame that you know we couldn't have them in and, and shake their hands and, and exit them as as I would have uh, perceived to be the right way. But you know conversations on the phone and, and AM um, saw both guys. Uh, briefly from a distance and, and they, um, yeah, they're, they're two guys that we wish every success in their future careers. Obviously, we've already made announcements in the back row and some young kids have renewed deals in terms of stepping up to senior rugby as well as the academy graduates. You've promised us a lock is coming in, so it's, it's not as if we are losing bodies that won't be replaced either. 
No, everybody who who has departed has been replaced um, in the in the squad, and some of that has been from the academy and, and the development programs. And we've we've targeted guys who we see as really having a future in Tigers colours, going to have to step up. Um, and we've signed from from overseas as well. So um, we haven't announced all of our signings yet. It's it's a um, we have some stuff that's done, but for for a uh, players' personal reasons, we haven't announced them. But um, that will hopefully be available for you in the next couple of weeks. So. <laughs> The only other departure obviously confirmed this week was the departure of Ed Hollis. There is reasons of which people can read online. It is a COVID-related departure in terms of the financial strains on the club. I guess the obvious question, not to put you under the pressure, is people are asking, how do you lose a head of medical in a medical pandemic? Look, it's it's a really difficult thing to to sell. Um, Ed did a fantastic job here throughout his career. I think he leaves that department in a, in a stronger position. And um, throughout his career, he was always very conscious to develop and grow the, the staff underneath him. As you said, this is a COVID related decision, and they, um, you know, the club have made no secrets that that it, it's very difficult times. Um, we've been pretty transparent with our uh, accounts and and. Um, you know, as a result, we've, we're having to make redundancies, and there will be further redundancies made. Uh, we we have to uh, uh, really tighten the belts, and, and uh, that was one of the decisions that was made on, on with that in in mind. So, um, you know, we we have lost a, a great person in Ed, and we will lose a lot of other great people in this really tough time. But the, the longevity of the club is is the most important thing. Obviously, they are the outgoings. One incoming of sorts was the club renewed a partnership with Clarity, who are your official travel partner for the club and, and sportsbreaks.com will do the travel for our away supporters when we are back up and running. Um, I guess from your point of view and from the player's point of view, it's good to see the support and the commitment from partners during this time. Oh, that's been one of the, the real, really, really great things about this. Um, I think in tough times, as I've always said it, you know, you really see people's true colours. Uh, we've been very, very lucky with our, our um support from our sponsors our sponsors have in in the whole i think renewed and, and we've we found some new sponsors as well that are really committed to leicester tigers and and that is that is a difficult thing to do and, and full credit goes to our corporate department and 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 they uh in relation to bringing in that money which is vital for us but um yeah you know clarity great company very very excited to have them on board with us and and they um again hopefully that can be a, a long-standing partnership so as I said, with some players going out, some players coming in, we have clarified this before, but there's still been questions floating around online from people. The media is asking the questions. Just to confirm, I want to put you on the record again, not, not the first time, but put you on the record again. Um, as of June 30th, no player whose contracts ended will represent the club. That's it. So players' contracts, when they are finished on the 30th of June, they are no longer our players, and as such, they are not eligible to represent Leicester Tigers. Players who arrive on July 1st, contracts begin, and they are eligible to play for us as of that date. So in theory, you could see players who have departed playing for their opposite, uh, for, for, against us in, in opposition in the same season. So uh, some very unique quiz questions going to be a, uh, brought about by the back end of this season. I would imagine that there are some issues presented given we are bringing in guys. Obviously, Kyle Brink is one. Shalva Mamu Kashvili. I'm getting very good at saying his name. Uh, obviously, Namani's coming across from France. There's a couple of young guys from across the United Kingdom. Is it a case-by-case -case scenario in terms of integrating them with training? Very much so, yeah. So those guys won't, won't begin with us until the 1st of July. Uh, not in the whole. A couple of will, will potentially arrive a little bit earlier than that. Um, but they, um, yeah, we have to take it case by case. We'll see where they're at. Um, the guys who are here have been training for quite a while and on their own. Now we have a chance to bring them in and assess them and see where they're at at, at, at Oval Park on, on Monday. And obviously that training program will be, will, will be tough. So, um, yeah, we, we'll see where everyone is. And, and when they're ready to play, we'll make sure that they're, a, um, they're out on the field. I think one of the things that's, that's important to remember is that this is probably the longest time that guys haven't been team training and haven't been you know catching and passing balls so it, it's been a long layoff although they have been training people will be at different levels so it's important that we set the bar high and, and guys try to get to that bar um, but we don't want to break bodies either so um, we'll, we'll try and be as smart as we possibly can. Obviously you mentioned Monday the return to training now it's a perfect time to bring Stuart in but I will ask you first 
they are not arriving on Monday and line out scrums, goal kicking, mauling, rucking, all the buzzwords. It's very much a restricted small group sessions. Yeah, we've split the, the group up um, into small groups of six or eight. And um, when they arrive, that before they arrive, they'll have to you know, fill out a medical questionnaire online to make sure that they're okay. When, they're, when they arrive at Oval Park, they're only allowed in certain windows. They'll have to exit their cars. They'll have to have their temperatures taken, haven't had the, the questionnaire filled. Um, they'll be allowed to park you know, a, a space apart, so we'll, we'll, we'll block all that off. So the guys are, are socially distanced in their cars, so when they get out of the cars, they're, not, they're away from each other. Um, they're on a one-way system into the gym, and, and Stuart can touch on this, where they'll, they'll do a gym program. They'll transition back out of the gym to their cars where they'll, where they'll put their boots on. Um, they'll take the field. We've 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 um, put some lines in, so we're uh, I think we've got ten tracks across the field, so the guys know that they're socially distanced and they will stay in around their track. Uh, they'll train on the field. They'll get back in their car and they'll leave the site, um, and that's going to run all the way through. So um, we'll have two groups on site as a ma- on site as a max at any one time. Um, so one in the gym and, and one on the field, but they won't be a, a in touching distance or well, they won't be within sight of each other so um yeah th- there's been a lot of hard work that's gone into it and Stuart can touch on some of the the, the work that he's done over the past week and um, if you drag him in at any stage sam and, and stop grilling you've, me you've done it all Jordy. I'm, I'm all right now <laughs> i actually i had a chance today from a social distance to see some things Stuart showed me the current situation i guess it's a very uh Stuart, you are formerly of the forces. I would say it was a very much regimented operation. You are certainly yeah. feeling like you are exactly nowhere to go, exactly what's going. It's like being in Ikea where you've got the lines and you've got to follow it around a little bit. Um, Just only slightly easier to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Stuart, I guess from your point of view, what to start it off, what is a COVID manager? So the reason you've got that job is because you do oversee the majority of security and safety staff at both venues that obviously yeah. includes maintenance staff and cleaning staff in this environment who are becoming more and more important not to take away from what they do before but so what is a covid manager yeah so that i mean that title came from the pgb from the Pro, uh, professional gaming board and that was something that every club has had to nominate a covid manager and a covid medical lead so that with my job being responsible for health and safety and operational safety around the stadium and training ground, that sort of unfortunately fell, uh, fell within my remit. So, yeah, so everything that we've had to put together this week and really in conjunction with Hodge and Cy, Cy Wallace um, over the last, well, more like over the last three weeks, really, since we got the um, guidance from the PGB, that that falls under the remit of the COVID manager to oversee that and make sure it's implemented. So yeah, we've done a hell of a lot of hard work over the last two weeks. And I think really a lot of it starts on Monday morning to try and keep that implemented, uh, make sure the guys are educated and stick into it. Obviously from the point of view of what the guys can do in a normal situation, I imagine Jordan says, we want the current facility to be available to do the following things for what we want to coach and what we want to train them in this situation. Is it reversed where he's essentially saying to you, what can we do? And then they'll go and build out some programs from there. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I think we we looked at it a few weeks ago, didn't we? And said, what, what is feasible? What is feasible on the site? Um, And I think the best thing to do is close most of it um, to to stop congregations because with, let's face it, we're still under government guidelines. So social distancing, increased hygiene, those risk mitigation factors, um, that's where we've had to base our, our work and our training programme from. So, um, yeah, everyone's worked together to, to, to piece that together and carry on from Monday morning. So, yeah, it's, um, it's good. I think, I think we've got the best of what we can do in phase one. And phase one should... We, we don't actually know how long that's going to be, four or five weeks, something like that. Um, and then phase two, hopefully we can, we can move on and start move, bringing more guys in together. So Geordie touched on in terms of 
I guess, loosely what they're going to have to do in, in staying, I guess, one by one, moving in certain directions, not being able to go to certain areas. What goes on when the players aren't there? So what have you had to implement in terms of what I believe is rigorous cleaning consistently, those sort of things? Yeah, so it's just it's just increased cleaning really. We've had to, we're, we'll be carrying out a deep clean this weekend to make sure it's um, spotless for Monday morning. We've put a lot of hygiene processes in uh, around the site, so there's hand sanitizer everywhere. Pretty much, you can you're, you're always there's a couple of meters away from hand sanitizer. Um, you know, little things like more hand washing facilities. Um, different chemicals we put all of them around the around the site um it'll obviously be getting cleaned every night and during the day as well so the players be strange for them really they're gonna have to clean their own gym gym equipment <laughs> after they've been on them so i have to give them some demonstrations <laughs> on how to do that but yeah so it's, it's gonna be strange for for them i guess you know some of them have worked and been in rugby for a certain amount of time to then suddenly be, this is your training regime. You come on your own. Don't talk to the guys. Don't train with the guys. It, it's almost going against everything they've been told for the last five, ten years. So it would be an unusual for them, I would have thought. And masks and PPE gear, all of that kind of thing. Are there actually strict rules in place with regards to what they have to wear? Yeah, so the guys are, are turning up in their, in their training kit and that's it. They won't even. They're not going to bring any bags, so there's no changing facilities or anything like that. They turn up in their kit, in the cars. They can get issued a mask at the front door. Um, sorry, at the front gate when they have their temperatures taken. Um, and we can we can give them anything else. We've got stocks of PPE, so we'll be giving them gloves if they require them in the gym. And really, that's it. They're up in the gym, do their weight session, down socially distance, and then straight on the pitch do some running, do some sprint training or whatever, whatever the s and guys have got set up for them. And then they're in their cars and away and gone. And as you, as I got the chance to see earlier as well, your maintenance team has been hard at work because the equipment in the gym that will be used, as you say, some will not be able to be used at all. And that's, that's just the nature of it. But it kind of looks a little bit like bathroom stalls, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. We've had to, sp- of course, for socially distancing, we've had to put screens up in the gym to to split the areas off. A load of gym equipment is is out of use. So, yeah, the guys have worked hard this week, and uh, sales and prospects must have absolutely gone through the roof because you can't get any anywhere. So, um, yeah, it's it's good. Anyway, I think we're set up ready for for Monday morning. Jordy, I mean, I'm not necessarily trying to be negative but the simple question really is that given that not a lot can be done what's the benefit or the reason in bringing guys back when they could do a lot of running and things like that at home or in a park by themselves um i think from a player's point of view from the, from the guys that i've spoken to it, it can be incredibly frustrating obviously you know the the, the surface at over park is is a nice surface to run on. You know, you don't have to worry about falling down a rabbit hole. You don't have to worry about your garden not being too big. Um, you don't have to worry about the kids coming running out and, and, and <laughs> way. Um, in, in the gym, I think that's one of the main areas that we're really anxious to get into. Um, you know, we, the guys physically didn't have enough equipment to do heavy weights at home, at least at uh, yeah, at Oval Park. They'll be able to get in, they'll be able to lift, um, they'll be able to, um, you know, do all of the things that they haven't been able to do at home. So I, I think that's in around the physicality of rugby. That's a hugely important area that, that, that they have. You know, we, we talked and joked with Darren Garforth about the props not having not having done any scrums in quite a while, but that's something that we need to do. We need to work on props next strength. And we don't know when we will go to stage two, as Stuart said, but when we do, we want to make sure that the guys are in physical, uh, physically peak condition so, so they're not risking a upper body injuries. So I want to stress for those watching, we, we will put the questions that you sent in to Haj, but I, I want to grab a few of them and steal. So I was, I was hoping you were going to ask Stuart them to be quite honest. That I'm, going to, I'm actually going to put him under pressure with a couple now, but I want to ask you one first, which is around this idea of non-COVID related risks in terms of injuries. Now, I know you're not the head of medical, so I appreciate you might not have the responses, but I'm sure there are discussions going on about those things you're saying, which is after three months of not 
having intensive training. I'm not saying the boys aren't training hard at home. Don't want to put that pressure on them. But there must be some worries or risks around those guys who haven't maybe done the capacity of running they're about to do. What we're seeing in other sports from across the world is that the levels of injuries have gone up after after COVID. And um, we saw it in the Bundesliga um, and the injuries rates went up, I think, from 0.25 per game to 0.88 per game, which seems like a you know pretty small number, but but still it is it is an increase. Um, so something that we're conscious of. Um, we're hoping not to have that, but something that, you know, if every other sport is seeing that, we're expecting that injury levels may be up. Um, so we have to be as smart as we possibly can about, you know, training the guys at an intensity that they can cope with. But we still have to train at an intensity. We still have to get fitter. We still have to get stronger and faster. So it's a very tight balancing act, um, something that we're aspiring to get right. Um, will we have injuries? Of course, that's the nature of it. Um, can we deal with it? Well, yeah, I think we can. Um, I mean, whenever someone gets injured, it'll create an opportunity for someone else. So um, I think it's a, uh, not that I'm wishing injuries on anyone, but um, yeah, it's something that we're, we're having to plan for. I think it's important to stress too, those guys with long-term injuries that would not be available to play next week should there be a game, they are not returning in this period. It's only those essential players, so to speak, isn't it? That, that's exactly the guidance we've been given by, by government. So it's, it's essential players only that will be on site. So guys who would be available to play for us if we had to play a game. Uh, well, now we have a start date on, on the 15th of August, so we're working towards that. Um, so that, they're the guys that we have on site trying to get guys ready for, for that start date. Stuart, do you have any guide? I know you said you're not quite sure how long it will run, but has there been any ballpark timeline in terms of when phase two may commence? Um, not really. There's, there is a ballpark of four or five weeks, something like that. But yeah, until we get that guidance from uh, BGB, yeah, we, we won't know. And I guess part of that is going to see how these first few weeks go, really, and see what, what is happening in the wider society because it, the, the R rate and everything that goes with the government briefings that you get, I don't think it would be possible for BGB to say four weeks, five weeks straight off the bat. It's really, it's what's happening out in the wider world. I would have and what happens on Monday if a player does arrive at whatever time and his uh, temperature is high? What, what happens then? He goes home. <laughs> um, yeah, and that, and basically the medical, t- medical guys uh, kick in there. So every player has had a quite a, a significant medical document, a, a booklet, with lots of different scenarios in. They've had to opt in to training. They've had to complete a questionnaire. Um, they've had guidance around what the site is, looks like and what treatment or if any, they'll be able to get. But the main thing, if, if they have a high temperature, they go home and then um, they'll be assessed by Harge then or Simon Wallace. But really, that's the club doctor who would take over them. And I guess... The question there, and I'm not sure if it's either one that you can answer, it might be one for Harge down the line, but, you know, Geordie Stewart, if someone does go down with an ankle injury while they're socially distanced running, what happens then? Is someone able, I'm I'm assuming someone is able to go and assist them? We will have a physio on site in PPE gear, but in order to treat anyone, the physio has to make an assessment of do they need treatment? Um, So that creates a... a, uh, a little bit of a grey area. I think if someone goes down and, and stays down with something serious, then obviously physios will have to make that um, make that assessment, be happy with it, and engage to treat, but in PPE gear. And while we know that we don't, sorry, while we don't know when phase two may commence, do we have any guidance on what will change when we come to phase two? Again, we, we haven't had anything concrete, and, and as Stuart said, we're waiting for guidance on that, but we're of the assumption that when we get through stage one, however long stage one takes, two to five weeks, um, that when we go to stage two, we'll, we'll be able to do more what resembles rugby, really. Um, so potentially some mauling, some tackling, some close quarter combat stuff. Um, stage two is really about getting the bodies right to play a rugby match, uh, and, and that's the way we're looking at it. Stuart, while you're firmly focused on Oval Park, certainly in this week and certainly next week, Welford Road is definitely your playground, so to speak. One of the big things people are talking about now, and obviously there's some stories around Twickenham and other sports around the world are looking at integrating fans back into match day. 
is there any work going on in terms of looking at those options for if we are allowed to have fans back in, how that might take place at Welford Road? Yeah, so we're, we're making a start on that now in conjunction with the club safety officer. And actually, there's a, there's a small sort of return to games team looking at that. Um, it's hugely difficult with not knowing how the social distancing is going to look in two months' time or three, even three or four months' time, however the finish of this season actually looks. Um, for example, I think there was, a, there was a story about Twickenham potentially having a, being able to have a small crowd at two metres, something like eight, something like that. For example, if it goes down to one metre socially distanced, they might be able to half fill the whole stadium at 40,000. So it makes such a huge difference that, that one metre, a little one metre. So um, we will make plans for both, for two metres and one metres, and that will cover all, all areas, hospitality, um, seating deck, all sorts. So, But yeah, it's pretty complicated. I guess what people are assuming it means is they're two metres apart from someone in the stands, but actually it's quite a thought before that in terms of how you distance when you enter the venue, if you use any facilities in the venue, actually moving to your seat up and down stairwells. That's the part where it's a sticking point, isn't it, on how you distance people? Yeah, of course, yeah. So you, you basically have to look at almost the entire journey from when they're coming into the stadium to leaving the stadium. And our north stand, for example, is, is over 10,000 seats. So you could probably look at that and think, yeah, we could get quite a few thousand people in there but you've got to go up a staircase to get into the seating deck in just about every area. Um, you've got to come through a set of turnstiles. Um, concourses, we're not even clear on how we will set up the concourses, whether we have a food offering, anything like that, queuing lanes. You, you know, if you've been to Tesco's and you have to, the queues halfway around the building, now how, how could we set that up in the concourse is one of the things we're looking at if that even happens. But yeah, we're quite thin on guidance at the minute, but um, we'll, be working, we'll be working with local authority, the Sports Ground Safety Association, who, uh, who basically give guidance on how we keep people safe at stadiums. So yeah, it's a, it's a big piece of work anyway, but we're, we've got that in process. Uh, for those who are geographically challenged like myself, the North Stand is the Holland and Barrett Stand, just yeah, to sorry. confirm. <laughs> I, when we are well, if we're over at Wellsford Road and people say to me, I'll meet you in the South Stand, I literally have to use the Compass app on my phone to know what they're talking about. Um, so given these measures that are taking place for the players, are you assuming that if we were to, were to return with crowds in any form, would they be getting temperature checks? Would they be having to wear PPE gear? Is that the same for them? I hope not um, for a stadium. I certainly hope not. I, like I say, it's going to be governed by what comes out from wider society um, and government guidance. So part of what set this up for the training ground came from DCMS, which is Depart uh, Department of Culture, Media, Sport. So they've given guidance on elite sport returning to training. So And that PGB follows on from that, their guidance. So... Yeah, we really don't know what it had looked like, but temperature checks for crowd I would have thought, will be quite an onerous, onerous process. You need to get one of those thermal car cameras that tells you if someone's warm. Yeah. Or... There's everyone selling them at the minute. There's a, there's a lot of sales popped up at the minute, thermal cameras, hand sanitizer, all sorts. I guess one of the... It, <laughs> Jokes aside, it takes you to the point, and the chairman's been very vocal in saying the following in terms of, I'm paraphrasing him, so I'm not quoting him directly, but while there are financial implications for COVID and a return to having crowds would help a club specifically like us in, with those that rely on the largest supporter base in the competition, you are the man charged with, unfortunately, saying health and safety comes first, and that's very much the Leicester Tigers' point of view here, isn't it? We will not be rushing back to make a penny or a pound. We will only be rushing back when it is safe to do so. Yeah, of course. We, it's quite clear and quite public that we need the, the finances, and that's that's what we're trying to gear towards. But um, both Chairman and CEO have been 
Andrew has been very clear from the start since we've been right the way through this process is that we don't we won't do anything until we feel safe. Um, we certainly won't have public in the building. We won't put the players at risk. Um, and you know, we've got back in there, which is which is great from my point of view. It's certainly taking steps forward, which is exciting for everyone. And like Jordy says, it gives the players something now to to look forward to rather than running around with their kids or like we heard from Ben Young's throwing a ball at his kid all day and sometimes hitting him in the face or whatever it is. But I guess to move away from three people who are not uh, doctors or nurses talking about medical stuff, Stuart, it would be criminal if I didn't ask you, the hotel build is underway, isn't it? Because again, in your playground, there seems to be a big hole where there used to be a car park. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's really exciting. There are, uh... The contractors are, are cracking on with that. That's it was strange that sort of started virtually as lockdown lockdown started, um, but yeah, they're they're in the ground. The site's the site is secure and they're um, they're going well. They're doing they're doing well. It's looking good. It's it's a shame not many people have been able to see it from say where I can see it at the top of the Holland and Barrett stand out the windows there you can actually look out and see but they're making good progress and um, certainly exciting to have that um right next to right next to the stadium that hole in the barrett stands the north stand isn't it is that the right that's one the, yeah. that's the right that's one the, i'll write that down yeah. so uh, look we, we are discussing finances and as i said it has been a big week so to move away from looking ahead i just i do need to ask geordie because i can't not touch on it there's obviously been a lot of talk this week around the salary cap moving forward for the next four to five years. There's a lot of talk about proposed wage cuts or continued wage cuts of which people have accepted, you know, staff as well as players across the game. It, where is the club at at the moment? Look, it's, it's, a, 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 it's a tough position. Um, as we said, you know, people have taken wage reductions so far and, and there are proposed wage reductions going into the season across the board in the club. And they... Um, you know, that hasn't been finalised yet. You know, we're still waiting on, on the RPA to come back on that. But, but the clubs unanimously agreed that for the state of the game and the good of the game um, on Monday, they, they agreed that, you know, that those cuts should take place into the season. So we will be looking to support that. Um, again, we have to have some dialogue with, with our players in around that. But, we, you know, we've tried to keep the guys in the loop throughout the whole process um, on the back of a, a, a strange start to, to the whole COVID day issue. So um, our guys have been incredibly supportive of it. Um, they've obviously all, um, no one wants to take a pay reduction, but, but they, uh, they understand it and they, um, you know, we're working through it as we go. I guess from the point of view of a fan, they are wondering if, if this presents any further issues around the timing of it, but are you, you're going to have the players back on Monday, aren't you? Yeah, our players, as Stuart said, you know, we, we had a, a medical questionnaire sent out to the guys this week and they all had one-to-ones with doctors, uh, with you know, different doctors. So, so, so they, you know, they understood the mitigation, mitigation and mitigation of risks. Excuse me, it's easy for me to say Sam. Um, uh, from our point of view and, and, and they all have opted in um, to a man. We're expecting to see everyone who's in the country and available to train uh, and available for selection on the 15th of August on Monday, uh, the 15th of June. So, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting to, to actually sort of be back in, see those guys again face to face and have conversations from over two meters, of course, Sam, yes. but, um, it's a, yeah, yeah, all of our guys have been very supportive. The only other thing I want to ask you, Geordie, cause it, it has been reported and, I, you know, credit to those senior players who have spoken in terms of wanting to make sure those lesser earning players in each squad are not overlooked in this wage conversation. It's been reported even as late as today that those players at the very end or the bottom of the spectrum are not necessarily affected, are they? No, no. Our development squad um, is not subject to um, wage reductions um, from, uh, you know, in the, in the coming season. Um, that was something that was very, very uh, important to all of the club, the chairman and, and the uh, CEO. We wanted to make sure that our development group um, could afford to live and, and obviously um, people on, on the lower end of the pay grades um, particularly feel, feel reductions at any stage so um, just uh, earlier in the week we were able to tell those guys in the development squad that, that they wouldn't be facing wage reductions and, and they, uh, they can focus on, on trying to develop and grow as rugby players and, and hopefully uh, transition through into the first team. When it rains it pours eh Jordy? You haven't really got a minute do you to think? Not really no. 
don't need a minute to think anyway, Sam, to be quite honest with you. It'd be dangerous if I did. Uh, I guess to, to wrap it up, I, we have to thank Stuart. And um, obviously, fans, we will be looking to show you what is going on, obviously, from a social distance as well. We will be keeping our distance. And I'm quite sure there's a large amount of players happy that I have to keep a distance from them from now on. Yeah. Um, well, probably not just players. But... I guess, thank you, Stuart, for that. We will undoubtedly have to have you back on if and when crowds are allowed back in. Um, I'm certain that the famous terrace will present some issues for you. You might be out there with a spray can and stepping two metres each time. A distinct but, possibility. <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, as you said, you, you raised the fact that we rely on the large supporter group. We run into an issue, and we've talked on it before. It's, a, it's almost an issue we're proud of. Um, as silly as it sounds. So, Geordie, once again, we will have to catch up with Haj next week. I think he's promised us a day and a time, but I'm not going to say it because if he lets us down again, I'll be ridiculed relentlessly. So I'm not going to do it. But um, if you do have more questions for Haj or if you have a question for Stuart that wasn't answered, I'm sure I can bug him into providing a response. I guess at the moment what's notable is that a lot of work's going on without necessarily a lot of long-term guidelines so patience is required and and appreciated um Stuart thanks for your time I know you're very very busy so we've taken you away from planning and you've probably got a late night and a weekend of work Geordie you will uh probably be working this weekend I imagine always Samba always mate um a few more bits and pieces to get done and we'll have some calls to make tomorrow over the course as well so yeah the uh, weekends just roll into the weeks now What's exciting is that Premier League's returning soon. And while we are rugby fans, we do or will eventually get to see Liverpool win the Premier League. So that's exciting. Huge oh, exciting on that note. <laughs> <laughs> the only two Liverpool supporters in Leicester. It'll be, very, uh, it'll be a very, very big uh, yes. moment, fam. Leicester City will probably come second. And that, that you shouldn't be frowned upon. Second is very, very respectful. But Liverpool are the greatest team. So that's what's important. <laughs> I appreciate both of your time and I will see you again next week. I'll see you on Monday with my mask on and my gloves and everything. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Cheers, guys. Yeah.